What's going on ladies and gentlemen and welcome to another video. Now in today's video we'll be covering the entire TOEFL speaking section so take out your notebooks, grab your writing utensils and get ready to take some outstanding notes. Here's the independent speaking question. In my eyes, the statement that friends are the most important influence in one's life rings true to me. To begin with, the first thing that came to my mind as I read this question is that surrounding oneself with good friends is very significant. This is mainly due to the fact that people usually spend most of their free time with their friends and thus end up resembling each other's behaviors. In addition, having too many bad friends can be very detrimental. since countless teenagers have become victims of peer pressure and gone down the wrong path due to those in their vicinity. As a result, I definitely believe that friends are the most important influence in one's life. All right, now when I was done with the second detail, I noticed that I had about seven seconds left, which is more than five, so I went ahead with the ending statement. Now, the shorter version of this ending statement for all agree-disagree speaking questions can also be, as a result, I agree or disagree with the given statement. So if you feel like saying the ending statement or the entire statement, the given statement, the phrase in between the quotation marks is a bit burdensome for you, then you can choose to say this shorter ending statement instead. All right, now let's move on to task two. Now listen to two students discussing the announcement. Did you read about the new plan? Yeah. What do you think? I think it's a great idea. Really? Why? Well, I just don't think the newspaper gives the most up-to-date information about activities. Well, the paper comes out weekly. What's the problem? The fact that it comes out just once a week is the problem. I read the paper every Monday. But then I forget that they're having a concert or showing a film or whatever, like on Thursday or Friday. And this will always give me a reminder on the day of the event. Yeah, that way you wouldn't forget. And, like, if something gets canceled at the last minute, well, that way you'd know and you wouldn't waste time showing up and no one's there. Well, I hadn't thought of that. That would be really helpful. But do you think students are actually going to read the email? Are you kidding? Everyone checks their email at least once a day. And if maybe they also include the cafeteria menu for the day in the email, well, then people are definitely going to read it. You're so right. I can't wait until they start. According to the announcement, the university is planning to send all students a daily email containing information about campus events and activities. And the woman is looking forward to this. First and foremost, the woman mentioned that the campus newspaper doesn't give the most up-to-date information because it comes out just once a week. As a result, the woman often forgets about events like concerts, but she won't forget anymore if she gets reminders every day. On top of this, the woman also said that 
everyone on campus checks his or her email at least once a day. Plus, if the cafeteria menu is included in the email, people will definitely read it. Therefore, because the school believes that this decision will ensure that all students are always up to date, the woman supports the university's new plan for these two reasons mentioned in the conversation. All right, let's move on to task three. Now listen to part of a lecture in an education class. So I used to teach a class of eight-year-olds and one problem I sometimes had was getting the kids to raise their hands when they wanted to answer a question. Like lots of teachers, I had the rule that if a student wanted to answer a question, they needed to raise their hand in the air and wait till I called their name before speaking. That gave all the students a chance to participate which helped everyone get more out of the discussion. But some kids had trouble following the rule. I remember there was one girl, Sarah, who didn't raise her hand when she wanted to answer a question. She would just call out the answer. And this was frustrating for the other children who were waiting patiently with their hands raised. So one day when Sarah called out, I asked her if she knew that calling out was unfair to the other students. I said to her, Sarah, do you realize that when you call out answers without raising your hand, you're not being fair to the other students. You're not giving them a chance to answer questions, too. And I didn't wait for her to answer. I just continued teaching the class. And after that, any time I asked the class a question, Sarah didn't call out the answer. She raised her hand along with everyone else. In the lecture, the professor elaborated on a specific example of a girl named Sarah to explain the concept of questioning awareness of effect. To begin with, the professor had problem getting kids to raise their hands in class before speaking. To be more specific, one girl named Sarah always called out the answers without raising her hand, which was really frustrating for the other students. Consequently, one day, the professor asked Sarah if she realized that she's not being fair to the other students and didn't wait for her to answer. Hence, Sarah started to raise her hands along with everyone else because of the question the professor asked her. To sum up, this was a perfect example of questioning awareness of effect, which is one way a teacher can correct disruptive behavior in the classroom, given by the professor in the lecture. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. All right, let's move on to task four, the last question. Listen to a part of a lecture from a history class. The professor is talking about the Industrial Revolution. Back in the 18th century, in a time known as the Industrial Revolution, some countries well, England, in particular, started using new technology, like steam-powered machines, to produce goods. And the use of these machines brought about some significant changes. Let's go over two main changes that occurred. 
One change was that the center of production moved from homes to factories. Um, let's take fabric or cloth as an example. Historically, for a very long time, people had made cloth by hand in their homes, earning a little money from their home-based cloth production. But then these new steam-powered machines for weaving cloth were invented and placed in factories, and these machines could weave cloth much more quickly and efficiently. So there wasn't any reason to keep making cloth slowly in homes when it, it could be made faster on factory machines. Thus, the majority of cloth production shifted from home-based businesses to factory production. Another result of the new technology is that cities started forming around factories. Like, let's say there was a cloth factory that was built in a certain small village. Now, of course, the factory needed workers to operate the machines used in cloth production. So the factory would hire a lot of rural workers who would then move from the countryside to the village. So instead of being spread out all over the countryside, the workers started to congregate in the village with the factory. As a result, the village got bigger and bigger and eventually grew into a city. The professor gave a lecture about how the Industrial Revolution brought about some significant changes. To begin with, the center of production moved from homes to factories. For instance, new steam-powered machines could weave cloth much faster than human hands. Subsequently, the majority of cloth production shifted to factories because of the Industrial Revolution. Furthermore, cities started forming around factories which needed a lot of workers. Needless to say, countless individuals moved from the countryside to villages, which eventually grew into large cities. In summation, this was how the Industrial Revolution brought about some significant changes, which was illustrated by the center of production and the formation of cities, given by the professor in the lecture. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. My dogs downstairs are barking and my dog right here in this room is moving around so there are a lot of distractions. At the real test, you will also have some distractions around you because you're going to be placed in a large computer center, a computer lab, with other test takers nearby. So regardless of who might be saying what next to you, you got to be able to maintain your composure and block out the white noise. All right? Okay. Those were the questions that I wanted to go over today. Those were the sample responses. If you enjoyed what you saw, experienced, and heard, leave a like on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you still have not done so. Share the content with your close friends and family members if they need the extra help. But most importantly, if you are a self-disciplined and dedicated person, reach out to me about my tutoring slash coaching services. Let's get the score that you need and deserve as soon as possible. See you in the next video. Peace.